Uh, I'm going to um, reconvene uh, the session from closed session, and um, there weren't any actions taken in closed session, so we're going to start the meeting with an invocation led, led by Trustee Whit Rydell, uh, followed by a Pledge of Allegiance led by Trustee Carolyn Inman, and then public comments. So thank you. So first we have the okay. um, invocation. Okay, we ask through our higher power, or Heavenly Father, may your goodness and love be present among us, amongst us this evening. Bless our meeting with unity, hope, and vision. We pray for vision. May your vision bless us abundantly with the wisdom, guidance, and courage, and strength so that we can wisely use the gifts you have given us as trustees, both individually and collectively. We ask for your guidance that our administrators, faculty, and classified employees serve our two colleges in ATEP, and do so with ethics, honor, and humility. Give us insight and courage to benefit the entire campus community and beyond. We pray for unity and inclusion. Build in, us, build in all of us a deep respect for one another so that we can work together as one, that our students, community, and employees will be better for the decisions we make. We pray for hope. Come stir our hope within our hearts and inspire us to solve the challenges we face with truth and transparency and to take joy in our shared triumphs, both simple and grand. In respect and hope, we trust in your presence and guidance this evening. A pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, and now we go to public comments, and there's two public comments. First, um, an employee named Jennifer Jazayan. Is, is that pronounced that right? Hi. Okay. It, uh, can you go over there so we could hear you? Thank you. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Close, Jazayari. Jazayari. Okay, thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name's Jennifer, as you just heard. I'm here um, as an employee of the district since 2003. I'm here to request that the district drop the policy that requires weekly COVID testing of asymptomatic employees um, who are not vaccinated. As you all know, you either have to be vaccinated or have the exemption. Earlier in the pandemic, the data was unknown about the transmission of the disease and the effectiveness of vaccines. We now know that getting vaccinated protects the individual from severe disease, but it does not prevent getting infected with COVID. As everyone knows, they're friends and family, right? Or yourself. Um, it also doesn't prevent you from passing it on to others or spreading it. So breakthrough infections are no longer breakthrough or rare occurrences. My vaccinated coworkers could be infected with a COVID variant, just like I could be whether or not the symptoms are mild, moderate, or no symptoms at all. Why then are only unvaccinated people required to take weekly COVID tests to be on campus? I can only assume that this testing policy was put in place to protect everyone on campus um, from contracting COVID. But the data now shows that either all employees should be tested weekly, or none of them should be, unless they have symptoms. Uh, it's discriminatory at this point to only test those who have exemptions to the vaccine mandate. This policy is basically treating unvaccinated people as diseased individuals, which encourages stereotypes and prejudices to arise. We've seen this type of thinking throughout the history in this country, usually against racial groups being labeled as diseased. The data does not support the belief that we should all fear being infected by an unvaccinated person, but not a vaccinated person. I urge you to follow the science like we like to use in this district. We like to follow the science, not myths and misinformation, right? To drop this discriminatory policy, which singles out employees only who are not vaccinated. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you for your comments. And um, now Margot Lovett, um, the, I'm sorry, uh, 
Professor Marco Loves. <laughs> you know, you guys, I just can't stay away. What can I say? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so tonight I would like to address agenda item 7.5. Whether or not we should continue the mask mandate should not be the subject of debate. The fact that COVID case rates in Orange County are nearly double what they were last fall at the start of the academic year, and that test positivity has risen from 6.1% in the fall to 19.5% now means that it would be irresponsible to do anything but to continue to require masks in all indoor spaces. The only issue should be who will make that decision. At last month's board meeting, I expressed my gratitude to the trustees for demonstrating wise and responsible leadership by allowing the chancellor to reinstate the mask mandate to extend until today. Now I am asking you to continue to show wise and responsible leadership by adopting option two, which is extending the mask mandate indefinitely and delegating authority to the chancellor to lift the mandate or to reinstate when necessary if COVID to lift it if COVID rates fall below 10%. Doing so would demonstrate to all current and future students and their families and to all district employees that you are committed to protecting the health of all members of our colleges and district community. And lastly, I'd like to make a comment about um, management. And I don't remember where I heard this, but it has stuck with me to this day. And that is the definition of a good manager or a good leader is that you hire good people and you leave them alone to do their jobs. And I think that would be um, the case by delegating the authority to the chancellor, who is a good employee that you all have hired. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Lovett. Thank you. Um, and now we're, we're going to um, board reports, um, board reports. So first we start with our board of trustee members. So we'll start with trustee Prendergast if you have a board report. Thank you. Uh, so last week I, uh, some other trustees attended the, um, the Saddleback College uh, film presentation. Uh, five films that were uh, done by students, um, one of them even went on to the Khan Film Festival, and it was, it was a really powerful evening. It was really good quality, little shorts, um, very impressive. Uh, and and I, I think we all enjoyed it, for those of us who were there. It was, it was really entertaining. Uh, and I think, I think it's going to be one of those nights where we uh, recognize this is the last meeting for our chancellor. We're going to miss you. I have appreciated your candor, ethics, your administrative skill, and you really are going to be missed. I, I, it's hard to believe that this came. <laughs> to, this is the day. Uh, but thank you for your leadership. Thank you for everything you've done for this district. Um, the balloons and streamers I ordered didn't show, uh, <laughs> but uh, I apologize for that, but thank you. But TJ told me they were going to be at your house. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Oh, that's where they went. <laughs> um, I'd like to dovetail that and say thank you so much, um, Chancellor. Um, you've worked very hard and... Uh, brought a lot of information. Uh, we appreciate that. So thank you. It seemed like yesterday you and I were hitting Dana Point and the harbor and going out to dinner, and it's hard to believe today's come. So, but thank you. All right, I don't have a lot to, to share. I've been in Oregon, going up the Oregon coast. If you've never done it before, I have to tell you, it is magnificent. And that's with um, all capital letters. Um, I was very fortunate to go visit some of my college nursing buddies that happened to live in Oregon. So it's even uh, a, a better treat. Um, I, but I, oh, I forgot. I went to visit, for those of you who remember, Dr. Rich McCullough. Um, he was a physiology professor and also the president of Saddleback. And I got to spend an evening with his wife. It was very, very nice. Hmm. 
Okay, um, I am very sorry that I missed um, an executive meeting and my uh, DEI meetings that I have been attending on, on a, a webinar. I was in flight, but I will report back when I see the video for the DEI meeting. It was a town hall meeting, a compilation of everything that we've done this summer. So thank you. Okay, Josie Dumas. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry I missed the film festival. I am going to try to watch. I got the link, and so I'll try to watch it. Um, I am going to do it. I haven't. I kept telling myself I'm going to do it. I am going to watch it. I uh, heard great things about it. Thank you, Trustee Prendergast, for raising that issue. And I want to say it's, um, it's only been two months since I've been on, you know, I was on campus the other day, but the Gateway Building, wow. Wow, that's great progress. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed it the other day when we were here for our board officer meeting, and uh, it's looking fantastic and can't wait till it, it comes to completion. So uh, I know, Elliot, you're excited, and I think everyone here is very excited about that. Um, I is, uh, just mentioned briefly, um, I did, uh, some of you know, um, travel to my homeland of Armenia in June for an international conference, and I'm not going to go into a lot of the details, um, but I will say that the power of education there is real. Um, I mean, this is a people and land who are under siege, um, and we held the conference at the American University of Armenia, which I used to teach at. Um, Long time ago, 1999, 2001, I was an adjunct faculty at the American University of Armenia, teaching business communications and, and other courses. Um, and uh, it is affiliated with the uh, UC system. Um, and it just and that's where we had the conference, and a lot of the students participated in the conference. Um, so the power of education is really real, especially when you, when you see it in situations like they are in um, with war and uh, military attacks daily. Um, the, the way we move forward is education. And uh, American University there is just fabulous and been involved, still involved in, in a number of ways, helping raise funds for them. Um, <clears throat> so uh, lastly, I'm glad the other trustees raised up, raised, the idea, raised the, that it is the chancellor's last meeting. I think she was a consequential, Kathleen, a very consequential chancellor, um, leading during a period of, COVID and um, remote work and uncertainty. And I think of, of all the things I think of Kathleen, it's definitely a person of conviction and certainty. And I, and I um, appreciated uh, her role, especially during that period of time. It's not a period of time for everybody, but I think, um, I think she did it well. And I wanna thank her for that and wish her the best in the future. Thank you. Thank you, okay, Trustee Jay. I want to thank Kathleen, too, for the wonderful job she's done. We'll miss you. And you've done great. It was very hard during COVID. New grounds, new things, everything was new was during COVID. And I also did attend the film festival. It was very good. And uh, uh, Thursday, July 21st, the IVC Foundation held its annual summer planning retreat. There are some exciting opportunities coming our way. Thursday, October the 20th, is the third annual IVC Giving Day. For every $2 donated, the foundation will match it with a dollar, with a limit up to $500 in matching funds for account. Plans are also well underway for the annual event, celebrating excellent. Please mark your calendars for Friday, March 10th at the Lions Air Museum. There will be a variety of ways to get involved and to support the students and programs of IVC. During the retreat, we learned about the endowments and the bequests. When you establish an endowment, you provide an ongoing income stream for the college in perpetuity. They can support a Pacific program or scholarship. It is an incredible legacy, and at IVC you can create an endowment with a $10,000 gift. A bequest is when you include the college in your estate plans. This can be done by leaving a specific amount, a percentage, or a residue of your estate. It is a very simple process, and it is a wonderful way to impact 
the college and help the students. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Inman. Yes, thank you. Um, during the, the last month, there weren't a lot of events to go to, but what I did do was um, I write a column for an independent newspaper in the city of Irvine, and um, we, it has a title. It's called Community College Corner, and uh, we have 20,000 subscribers and 44,000 plus followers on our Facebook page. And so I had written, I had done a column called School Watch that had to do primarily with K-12, and I did that for like five years, I guess it was. And uh, so now I've changed, and so th this is, the, the fun thing that we did for the last about eight weeks was we um, had a portrait of a student each time, and the student had to be an Irvine resident and was also graduating and really excelling tremendously. And we honored, forgive me if I don't say it right, I'll try. Anna Nam, D'Angelo Hunter, Brittany Kester, Johan Bion, Austin Lake, Brooke Al Syed, Sandos El Bershawi, and Nathan Akiyoshi. So it was really, really fun. And what it showed was that many of them, um, well, I'll just say it like it is. Many of them could have gone any place they wanted when they got out of high school, but they chose the path of coming there here first because there are so, such tremendous advantages to doing that. Brittany Kester, for instance, got um, the Jack Kent Cook can't talk Jack Kent Cook scholarship. There's, I think, it was 1,200 applications for 100 people. And it's up to thirty-five thousand dollars a year for three years, and you know that was a that was a great decision on her part, rather than going straight into a four-year school. So, and then others, uh, um, they all have fantastic um, um, accomplishments and goals, and they're all going to great schools and now for the rest of their education. Somebody wrote as a on the you know as a comment, it makes me even prouder to be part of this district. And that's the way I felt as we, can, you know, we finished each article and, and posted it. And I, too, want to thank you, Kathleen. As the new person, she said, you can ask me any questions anytime you want. <laughs> and so every Sunday night before, I would get my questions. And you were just incredibly kind to, and patient. <laughs> you know, I know there had to be times where you thought, I can't believe she doesn't know this. <laughs> you know? But uh, it really helped me a great deal. Some of them were specific and others were about how things are, are done. And I really appreciate that as well as everything else. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. Um, now I'll give my report and then the student trustee after that. Um, I, I'm actually going to discuss primarily just one program, and it was the same program that several other trustees talked about. It's the Cinema, TV, and Radio Department that invited us to a student film extravaganza at the McKinney Theater. And these were incredibly wonderful short films done all by students. Um, so I congratulate the, class, the professors, classified professionals, and students for these first-rate films. And as, as Trustee Prendergrass said, one of the films was screened at the Cannes Film Festival in France. Yes. Um, and among the dignitaries who attended the screening were Trustee Prendergrass, Trustee Barbara Jay, Dean Scott Farthing, Professor Hiro Konishi, and our film professionals, Matthew, Bro Matthew Brodet, Randy Van Dyke, and Scott Ferguson Green. And then after that, I was able to meet with some of the student filmmakers who discussed how they made their films. And this was Adrian. Gallardo, Cynthia Nguyen, and Richard Eldridge for the screening. And I just want to mention that Saddleback's Film Studies Department is well known for its excellence. My son actually took classes there, and a friend got a great job doing films after completing the program. And one of the students who applied for our AAUW scholarships noted she attended from North County primarily because of the excellent reputation of the film program. And I too want to echo um, my fellow trustees' remarks about um, Chancellor Burke. Um, you, you really have done a fabulous job during, I know you're going to help us a little bit for a few months um, by giving us, help, uh, for a month at least, for giving us advice, and, and we really um, will welcome that. 
but um, you, you stepped in, and who would have known there would be a worldwide pandemic, that we had to make these really difficult decisions about masks and vaccines and how do we keep our students safe? And this is like the first time we've had a pandemic like this since this what they call the Spanish flu in 1918. And um, we had to do whatever we could to keep our students safe and to keep the classes going and to keep students going to classes. And we did. We kept our students going to classes. We, we changed to online classes in one week. We, we kept our students safe. We kept things going beautifully. And, um, and it, wasn't, it wasn't easy. These decisions are not easy because they're like we're making them in kind of a area that no one's ever made them before for a hundred years. So, so, um, so we really, really thank you for all your help and all your um, uh, good work. And um, stay in touch and keep giving us good advice. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, now Trustee Ab Ab Abelos. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, hello to the board, staff, and faculty. I also want to say. Thank you so much, Chancellor Burke, for serving the students um, on behalf of the student governments of Saddleback and IVC, and on behalf of all the students, we want to thank you so much for, for serving us and for, um, for keeping us safe, as our other trustees have said. And also, thank you so much for helping me in my transition into serving as student trustee and for always being there um, for any questions that we might have. Um, uh, you're really a, a leader that puts the students first. So I'm really grateful. Um, and I apologize that I was out sick for the June board meeting, but I'm grateful to be back here to represent our students in person. Uh, from the Saddleback campus, um, the student government has been organizing um, and planning for voting events and resources that they plan to host beginning this fall semester to increase civic engagement and awareness on campus, especially with the midterm elections coming up. And they are planning to host start of school events during the first month of August to provide information and fund for, un for incoming students. And um, as of the ASG at Saddleback, um, we're having some board meetings and are currently planning some bonding events over the summer. And um, for the IVC campus, today our Associated Students of IVC voted on our budget for the 2022-2023 school year. And our budget goals reflect a renewed emphasis on planning student events for providing equity and building community. And our student government has also been planning our welcome back week to welcome students to IVC and to connect them to all the resources on campus that they need in order to have the best support for the start of their semester. And this is also to ensure a sense of connectedness to the student body on campus and set students on a pathway to their success. And lastly, um, I've also connected with other student trustees um, statewide to discuss student engagement basic needs and empowering the student body. And I'm also grateful to the district for including in our agenda the opportunity to attend the California Student Trustee Conference in August in San Francisco, along with other student trustees statewide. And thank you so much. Thank you, we're glad you're better. Thank you, thank you. Um, and next, Associated Student Government Reports, Gloria Lee Saddleback and Angelica Bustos, IVC. Are they the students here? No, oh, they're probably studying. Okay. <laughs> and Urban Valley College Academic Senate, Dan D. Relay. Uh, good evening, trustees and Chancellor Burke. Uh, Chancellor Burke, I've had many opportunities to express my appreciation to you. Uh, so tonight, I will simply say a very heartfelt thank you for who you are and for all that you have brought to us and done for us. Thank you. I'd like to comment on just a few academic items at IVC before speaking briefly regarding one of tonight's agenda items. Uh, I've been thinking this summer as I've been teaching my writing one class at IVC, and particularly this week, about student equity. Uh, many of my students at IVC and in my class come from backgrounds that did not provide them with educational equity. And more and more of my faculty and staff colleagues now come from non-majority families and cultures. Many were first in their family college students. Uh, in fact, I myself was raised by a widowed mom who worked hard to provide for my needs, 
but who did not have any academic college experiences to share with me. And so we educators are always learning how to best provide what we often did not enjoy. And it is a joy to see our students take this help and to succeed. So these efforts are part of IBC Senate's and faculty's goals this year to continue professional development surrounding issues of student equity and success, to continually improve our teaching in both the in-person and the online classroom experience, to improve faculty outreach to students, to partner with our classified staff to strengthen our programs and meet our students' academic needs. Uh, the fall semester is coming quite quickly and we as faculty want to be prepared to meet the needs of their students who await us on day one. And now just a few words about one of your agenda items and the fall semester. Uh, I've written to you uh, concerning agenda item 7.5 in my view on the need to keep our district's mask mandate in place during the continuing uncertainty surrounding COVID-19. I won't repeat my argument to you here tonight except to restate that infection rates indeed in Orange County are now significantly higher than when the board first approved our district's vaccination and mask mandates. Our numbers are moving in the wrong direction just as our community's pandemic fatigue continues to increase. And so instead of uh, repeating my written argument, I wanna close by sharing a story from one of my IBC colleagues in our history department, Professor Brittany Adams. Last week, Brittany wrote to me concerning her five-year-old daughter, Ada. Brittany writes that Ada decided on her own to start masking at school again, even though she's the only kid now wearing one in her class. She decided to do so in part because she has contact with her grandparents who are in their 80s, and she doesn't want them to get sick if she were to be exposed to COVID. Five-year-old Ada said to her mom about wearing a mask, quote, it's the least I can do. <laughs> I won't comment here on Ada's precociousness and her obvious future career as a community college professor, <laughs> but I will suggest that her heartfelt observation is one shared by our district's faculty, staff, administrators, and students, and that my students and I this summer have quite willingly worn masks in the classroom. We do so to keep it a safe place for us at school, and to help protect those we love at home. As Ada says, it's the least we can do. So thank you for your consideration of keeping the mask requirement in place and for continuing to put the health of SOCCCD students and employees first. Thank you. Thank you, that's be beautiful. Um, and next, um, Saddleback College Academic Center, Heidi Ochoa. Thank you very much. Good to see you, happy Monday. Uh, thank you for offering this space so I can speak today. Uh, my name is Heidi Ochoa, for those of us who, uh, who are attending this meeting today and I didn't get to meet this last time around. There's four issues I'd like to highlight. First, I just wanna celebrate the CTVR showcase. I too was able to attend the showcase and I was so wowed by the productions of the students and faculty members. And it took me back to moments when I was a speech and debate director and I would direct readers theaters. And it really made me think about all of the moving parts involved in education. You've got students with high anxiety. You have faculty with high anxiety trying to help to move, move those parts for the students. And one of the things that came from the CTBR showcase was conversations with CTBR faculty about processes on this campus that may not be doing our students or faculty good. Maybe the processes are taking uh, us a longer time or maybe the processes are requiring that students are paying more to create great work. And so I look forward to, as an Academic Senate Executive President supporting CTVR to find ways to uh, hopefully simplify and reduce the cost for students in the future. One of my favorite uh, pr productions from that particular showcase was the reparations piece. Mm -hmm. The second piece that I wanted to highlight was just that some of the Academic Senate executive team is actually receiving emails from student faculty, students and faculty about parking fees. Uh, I think that some of us are a little concerned about paying for parking, particularly if we only have one class and we're paying the same fee as somebody who perhaps has 12 classes on, the, on ground. So I think that 
that might be a discussion that the academic executive team wants to have with the district. The third uh, is regarding the mask mandate. Uh, I work with students who are scared. And you know, education can be a scary place as it is. So many of us are insecure about our skill sets walking into the room. And the last thing we need to do is worry about our health. And so I would just like to reinforce Dan's beautiful words and Margot Lovett's beautiful words that were already articulated earlier today. I also think in particular, or in relationship to um, what was it, 7.5? Um, I also think this is an efficiency issue. I think if we make these decisions quickly and, uh, and we leave it up to the chancellor that we are making decisions in a timely manner and we're not holding up our decisions and our communications, and when we align with the medical industry, we're also creating clear communications with our students. Um, because I think that sometimes students who are familiar with the medical lingo uh, wonder why it is we don't align. And when faculty have to explain that alignment in the classroom, you're putting faculty in the place of having to regulate things that they shouldn't have to. Uh, finally, I just wanted to say, Chancellor Burke, I remember your first presentation during an opening session, and I remember receiving it thinking, this is a teacher as a leader. And it's been really impressive to see your leadership. This has been a rough run, and I just want to say, I commend you on this amazing accomplishment. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, um, Heidi. Um, and next faculty association, it looks like Lewis Lung is here. <laughs> thank you. I am filling in for Melanie today. Okay, thank you. Thank and you. I will be reading a president's report that Melanie wrote. Okay, thank you. The faculty association supports a board action relative to um, agenda item 7.5, delegating to the district administration the authority to make decisions regarding masking mandates and other safety measures as recommended by the local health authorities. Day to day conditions can change suddenly and for the safety of students, faculty, staff, and the community, the district administration needs the ability to make timely health and safety decisions based on up-to-the-minute data. Secondly, speaking on my own behalf, I'd also like to thank Chancellor Burke for, um, after many years of experience in this district, for leading us in a rationally-led, collaborative, and consensus-driven district administration, which I think has benefited not only the operation of the district as a whole, but also the, just the day-to-day -day operations and attitudes of faculty members, students, and staff in the district, and I deeply appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. And, and next, um, the IBC Classified Senate is, but yeah. is that Amy Hunter? Hi. <laughs> Instead of Desiree? <laughs> Correct, <laughs> okay, yeah. Thank you. So um, good evening, Chancellor Burke and Board of Trustees. It's nice to see you all again. Um, so I'm past president of IBC Classified Senate, filling in for Desiree Ortiz. And just um, thank you so much, Chancellor Burke, for your leadership and your support and care for our classified and um, had great um, opportunity to work with you during your tenure here. So um, since the last board meeting, um, we've held our 22-23 uh, Senate retreat in the Irvine Ranch Water District Duck Club. Um, first part of our retreat was to have Franklin Covey training on speed of trust to help um, build our relationships with our colleagues as we continue to work on our commitments with our students and employees on caring campus, um, guided pathways and much more. And then we also spent the other part of the day um, doing our retreat and planning for 22-23. So we're looking forward to um, um, building our uh, classified uh, committees um, as well. Um, this week, um, myself and Marcella Reyes um, will be meeting with um, Michelle McDougall Jackson and Saddleback Senate. Um, show, uh, showcasing our IVC Caring Campus um, work. And then um, please visit us in August for our Flex Week, um, August 15th through 19th. We have several classified um, presentations and activities that we're a part of. Caring Campus Meet and Greet, a Discover IVC Passport to Resources, the Cajita Project, um, which we're looking forward to learning about everybody and, and um, coming together. And then our IVC Classified Senate meeting to so kick off the year. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. There are some great pictures of the class of, of you're putting on the presentation for the, um, for the um, Caring Campus um, in Dr. Hernandez's um, board report. So on, in the agenda. 
Okay, thank you. So the next um, item is uh, um, California, California School Employees Association. No, Saddleback, Saddleback College. Oh, yeah, Saddleback College Classified Center. Michelle McDougal Jackson, and welcome, welcome. Thank you. Yes, <clears throat> good evening, everyone. It's such an honor to be here with all of you um, as the voice for Classified Senate at Saddleback College. So, hello, for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Michelle McDougal Jackson. Um, I uh, began working in my role as the president for Classified Senate immediately after our April election. Um, but officially, it's been 25 days <laughs> that I've <laughs> held office, um, and the summer has been quite a whirlwind. I've attended the Classified Leadership Institute, uh, set planning meetings with the executive team uh, for Classified Senate, and we've laid out general Senate meetings for the fall for all of Saddleback Classified employees. This Thursday, as Amy mentioned, um, we will have our retreat for goal setting and planning for the 22-23 school year, and we'll be hearing from uh, IVC on Caring Campus to hopefully get us up to speed um, on that initiative as well. Uh, I have a wonderful team that I get to work with on the Classified Senate Executive uh, Board, and I'm looking forward to all the exciting things we're hoping to accomplish throughout the school year, and of course, working with everyone here. Um, I also wanted to take the opportunity to quickly address item 7.5 in the board agenda regarding the mask mandate and voice uh, Senate support in option number two. Uh, we feel that it would create a, assist in cre continuing to create a fluid and nimble decision-making process, which is imperative uh, not only for matters of public health and safety, but also helps to create a more positive campus climate for classified employees, students, and faculty alike. Uh, there has been wonderful safety-minded, clear communication throughout the district uh, within throughout the two years of this pandemic. And I want to express my thanks to the board for their support in this process thus far. It, it would not have been possible without you. And I'd love to see the continuation of that process continue. Um, thank you, Chancellor Burke. I know we haven't had a lot of time to work together, but it's to my point about the communication, uh, it's been such an honor to uh, work for a district that has been so clear and concise and gives everyone the peace of mind uh, of, of the goals throughout the pandemic and the safety-minded um, objectives. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. It's good to hear all the employees are un unanimous on that one item <laughs> that we all the employees we hear from. Um, and then the next California School Employees Association. Um, today is Gabrielle Lang Langingham in instead of Scott Ferguson Green today. What? Yeah, yeah, I saw that. Thank you. Uh, Gabrielle Landingham. La Lang yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, I know Scott's at a, at a conference in Las Vegas, yes. I think. <laughs> yes. Uh, good evening, President Milchicker and members thank of the you. board. Um, and again, uh, Scott Ferguson Green, our chapter president, is um, away at a conference. And as VP asked me to um, make a, a brief statement regarding uh, the uh, safety protocols, including the mask mandate. Mm. The California Schools Employees Association has been most appreciative that the South Orange County Community College District has maintained its pledge to keep everyone safe, from all of our students to every employee who works for the district, even the flexibility to determine when to implement the mask mandate, fully supported by CSEA. Keeping everyone safe is paramount. CSEA will always be in support of your authorization to give a top administrator of this district the ability to make decisions that may be needed on a daily basis on any given time as we continue to live through the COVID-19 virus and its variants. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. It's good to hear how all the employees feel about it. It's really important. Thank you. Um, and our next item actually is um, item 5.1. It's um, ATEP, our Goddard School Project. It's a public hearing. And um, Okay, item 5.1 is, is a public hearing, um, and then we'll vote on the item after the public hearing. Um, we are now on uh, agenda item 5.1, the SOCCCD public hearing for the certification and approval of the CEQA document, which is an environmental study addendum, approval of the plan and design documents for the submission of the City of Tustin 
and the approval of a ground lease with PJRJPA Venture. It's the LLC for the Goddard School at ATIP. Before we have that public hearing, Vice Chancellor Anne-Marie Anne Gable will provide an introduction. Thank you, President Milchicker. The agenda item allows the public to provide the Board of Trustees with comments and input before the Board considers approval of the Goddard School Project CEQA addendum, approval of the project site plan and design documents, and approval of the ground lease with PJRJPA Venture LLC. There are three additional board items that relate to this public hearing, items 5.2, 5.3, and 5.4. If you have any questions throughout this public hearing process this evening, both myself and Mr. Manhani Ephraim are here to assist. Thank you, um, Vice, Vice Chancellor uh, Gable. Um, board, board item 5.1, public hearing on the matter is now open. Um, comments are not to exceed Two minutes. Are there any comments or questions? No? Okay. We have to do the public hearing before you vote on it. Does the board have any questions to staff or our consultants to assist with their understanding of this matter? Um, the public hearing is now closed. Um, Vice Chancellor Gable, does the staff have any? No, no. There's there been no responses, so we don't have. You don't have to reply to any responses. Um, is there any further discussion on this matter by the Board of Trustees? Okay, five five point one is now concluded, and that was the public hearing. We will now move to item five point two, the board the board's approval of the resolution number twenty two eighteen, which certifies and approves the CEQA environmental initial study addendum for the project. It ratifies and adopts the mitigation measures and directs the staff to timely file a notice of determination with the Orange County Clerk and the State Clearinghouse. Um, I need a motion and a second so we can now vote. Someone. Oh. Who made the motion? Okay, Trustee Prendergast made the motion and Trustee Jamal seconded it. Okay, now, now we vote on this item. So all, all board, board members, please... Um, vote on your screen when it comes up. Did everyone vote? No, I guess they're, they're still working. It's a little, the system is slightly slow sometimes. Hmm. It hasn't come up yet, right? Yeah, it's there. Where is it? Behind your screen. Behind your personal computer screen. There you go. Oh, there it is. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. The, the, uh, the motion was approved on our board by um, six to, to zero with the student advisory vote voting yes. So we can move on to the next item. Thank you. We will now move to item 5.3, the board's resolution number 2219, which approves the, the project site plan and design documents and submittal of the site plan and design application to the city of Tustin and authorizes and directs staff to implement the project. So I, once more, I need a motion and a second. So moved. So Trustee, Trustee Dray, Jay makes the motion and Trustee Whitraydell seconds it. Uh, now we, we'll, we'll vote on it. There's three, three of these items that we need to vote on. Yeah, I don't really need it right now, thanks. I have to say this is the first um, public-private partnership that we're having on ATEP, and it's very exciting. This is the first of actually three different 
partnerships that we're having, and we're moving forward with it. So we're very delighted about this. Um, okay, this is uh, the um, resolution. The, the vote is uh, six to zero in favor of it with a student advisory vote of yes. And now we go to the next item, which is um, we can now move to item 5.3. The book. We just did 5.3. We're on 5.4. Okay. Right. Thank you. We will now move to item 5.4, the board's approval of resolution 2220, which approves the ground lease with, J, with PJRJPA Venture LLC, which is the Goddard School, and authorizes the chancellor or vice chancellor to sign and implement the project documents. So now we need a motion and a second again. So moved. Second. So Trustee Jay makes the motion and Trustee um, Inman seconds it. So now we, we can vote on, on the screen. Okay, the vote is unanimous, um, six to zero, um, and with the student trustee voting yes as well. Thank you. So we voted on all three uh, of those resolutions, and um, now we move to a um, another public hearing. Okay, here it is. We are now on, on agenda item 5.5 regarding a public hearing on the initial propo proposal on the mutually agreed reopener for Article 30, wages by the district and the faculty and the, and the SOCCCD faculty association. Before we hold the public hearing, Vice Chancellor Andy v Cindy Viscachill will provide an introduction. No, this is, oh, sorry. Excuse me, my fault. Thank you, <laughs> thank you President Melchicker. The board okay. will conduct a public hearing to provide an opportunity for the public to comment on the mutually agreed reopener between the district and the faculty association. If the board has any questions throughout the public hearing process, I am here to assist. Um, does the board have any questions for staff to assist in their understanding of this matter? Nope, I think they understand it. Okay, board item 5.5, the public hearing on the matter at hand is now open. Public comments are not to exceed two minutes. There's no public comments? No, no public comments? Um, then the public hearing is now closed. Is there any further discussion by the Board of Trustees? Then item 5.5 is concluded, and we will now move to item 5.6, adoption of the initial proposal on the mutually agreed reopener for Article 30, wages by the district and the SOCCCD Faculty Association, and we need a motion and a second, and then we can vote. So moved. Okay, Trustee Jay makes the motion. Second. And Trustee Edmund seconds it. So now we can vote. The vote is um, six yes, zero no, with this, uh, all agreed yes, and so it's unanimous with the student trustee voting yes. And the next item is um, 7.1, a student expulsion discussion. Vice Chancellor Viscachill, can you please take this item now? Thank you, President Milchiker. Members of the board and members of the public, the Board of Trustees will be deliberating the discipline of a student ID number 1138799 based on the outcome of the hearing held on May 5th, 2022. Although provided notice where the student would have had the opportunity to present evidence or cross-examine cross witnesses, the student did not attend. The student ID number 1138799, as is his right, has requested to have this deliberation heard in open session to the extent that it does not implicate the privacy rights of other students. The student also has the opportunity to address the board on this matter in open session. It is important to note that this is not a hearing or an opportunity for the student to provide evidence or witnesses to the board. The student was previously afforded the right to present evidence as part of the student discipline hearing, and that portion of the matter has been completed. The student may only make a statement during public comment, as would be afforded any other member of the public. Is anyone present on behalf of student ID 1138799? 
If so, you may pr proceed to the microphone and address the board. It appears that no one is present to speak on behalf of this student. The board may proceed to agenda item 7.2 for action. Okay, so, so now we're on item 7.2. So um, I do have one more statement oh, for 7.2. Okay, go ahead, because we have three options, so go ahead. Thank you. Board President Miltiker, I need to first correct 7.2 to add the student ID, ID number 1138799, as the way to identify the student we are taking action related to this item. Under this item, the board will take a formal action on whether or not to expel student ID number 1138799. In accordance with Administrative Regulation 5500, the board has three options in this matter. The three options are as follows. One, to support the recommendation from the college to expel the student. Two, to impose a lesser sanction on the student. Or three, to refer the matter back to the hearing panel for further consideration. At this time, the board can entertain a motion related to any of the three options before the board tonight. We will be taking the motion verbally and then allowing for a roll call vote. I Just, move option one. Okay, thank you. So, Trustee. I second it. Trustee Prendergast moved option one and Trustee Jay seconds it. So, now, um, Madam Secretary, can you call the roll? What's the call? Trustee Inman? Aye. Trustee Jay? Aye. Trustee Jamal? Aye. Trustee Melchiker? Aye. Trustee Prendergast? Aye. Trustee Whit Rydell? Aye. Thank you. So it, it, it's unanimous that we all voted for um, option one. Um, the next item is a board policy revision. Um, and it, it was discussed last month, so we can um, approve it. Um, is there a motion and a second? So moved. Trustee Jay makes the motion. Tr is Trustee Inman, are you seconding? Okay. Oh, you, the student trustee can make a you can you can make a motion and second it too if you like. Actually, we have a problem with that, so we'll oh. take trustee Inman. We'll take <laughs> trustee Inman. Okay. So did you second trustee Inman? Yes. Okay, thank you. So it's, it's the motion was made by trustee Jay, seconded by trustee Inman, and um, okay, now we can vote on it. These these policies were approved by B Park. Um, th this uh, motion has passed on a six to zero vote with a student advisory vote of yes. So thank you. Now we can move on to the next one item, which is um, the board meeting live stream discussion. Um, and it, this is at the request of Trustee Whit Rydell. Um, and the board will discuss the possibility of live streaming our board meetings. So, uh, do Trustee well, Whit Rydell, do you, do you lead the discussion? Well, um, it's exactly what it says. I would like to have our board meetings live. I know that they're on, what's 39? And I just think we would have more viewers, and I think it's more appropriate to submit it live. That's my opinion. I don't know how many people take a glass of wine and look at us, watch this <laughs> meeting on Friday evenings or Saturday. Um, I'm not trying to be facetious, but I do know that I've watched it a couple of times in my career on the weekends, but I think it's important to have it live, and I don't understand why not, so I'd like to hear any reasons why not. Uh, um, Trustee Prendergrass. Yeah, I, I'd like to support the idea in, in, the, in the sense that, uh, especially with today's technology, when we were on Zoom, we were essentially live streaming. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I know that other districts do this, both K through 12 and, and college districts, and. Uh, city councils and boards and stuff of that nature. Uh, I think, I know personally, um, not everyone gets 39 <coughs> in our district. I don't. So I couldn't watch myself if I wanted to unless I go to the, the links on, on the website. 
um, which <coughs> I've done, but, you know, like I watched last meeting because I missed it. But uh, so, yeah, I think I think it would definitely increase our transparency and access to our to our constituents. I, I was I, I was just told, and we could uh, confirm this with staff, but that um, if they would live stream the meetings, it would done, be done on YouTube, and that way everyone could watch it on YouTube. And I, I get Channel 39, but I don't get the Irvine Valley College TV channel, so so we don't really get to see what happens up at that TV channel. So interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, Trustee Jamal. So I think this is long overdue, and Trustee Rydell, Whit Rydell, thank you for offering this up. Um, I believe it was discussed at some point in the past, but I think Tr Trustee Prendergast is right. Um, we need to be transparent. We are, but this just, I think, increases the level of transparency. There's no reason why they shouldn't be simulcast live as other public agencies do um, <clears throat> across the state. Not all of them, but many of them do. And we certainly have the, and, and I guess that's where I, if I may ask our Vice Chancellor of Technology, uh, is there any reason why we would not be able to uh, simulcast uh, our board proceedings? And if, assuming the answer is no, in what manner would you recommend or is it something you need to think about? Um, I mean, the, the modem, is it YouTube or is it just a live stream? Um, so. Uh, we can have the technology in place. Um, Thank you. It might be YouTube, but it might be something else. So we'll do a little bit of research. Okay, great. And if we were to adopt this resolution tonight, would it? Do you think this? There, there is no resolution. I don't mean resolution. I mean if we, we we're not if we adopt, to, we're not, it, we don't vote on it tonight. So because it's not it's not on the agenda for voting. It's on the agenda for discussion. Okay, let me rephrase it. Sorry. <laughs> let me rephrase it. If the board tonight indicates that that this is the direction we want to go. How soon do you think this could be in place? By the next board meeting. Yes. There you go. Thank you. Just for clarification, Just we'd have to vote on that, though. Apparently. Oh, we would have not. to vote on it on the next meeting. Is that true? Before we, um, we no, get it we done? Just Give the direction and make make it so. Yeah. Okay. It's okay. A request. I like that. I like that. As long as as long as <laughs> we there's don't usually a get to do that. Okay. As long as there is a majority that's in favor of it. Okay. Oh, Trustee Inman. I just wanted to agree. Uh, I I've, I've been used to in my town watching it, you know, all the time and uh, going in when there was something that was of particular interest to me. And I think that it's it's really helpful for people to be able to see it easily and not have to make the effort to come in. If, and they just learn over, over time and they enjoy it and feel more a part of. Mm -hmm. okay. so I think it's great. Thank you yeah. for putting it on. One more Do you have something to say, Trustee Jay, or no? Well, I think it would be good for the community. Yeah. I, I, I have to say, I still recall when we decided finally to have our, our, our meetings filmed and to broadcast it on Channel 39 and whatever the channel is in Irvine. I, I, I would hope they would be broadcast on both, but maybe they're not. And I remember when we were doing it, they filmed our board meeting to, to see how it would look. And I got a note from every single board member, and I opened them all up, and they all said my mascara was running. <laughs> so, oh, <no. laughs> So anyway, hey, can, I, uh, can I add one more thing? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, so just going back to, you know, uh, the access, uh, a lot of people, myself included, and now President Hernandez, we've cut cut the cut the cord, so to speak, on the cable, and so mm -hmm. the the fact that a lot of people have YouTube TV or Hulu TV yeah, do. don't have the thirty nine option on that, so that's why it's not just a cable access issue anymore it's it's live streaming on those platforms so you, so you, i think i think our director of it will look into that and i think that it's mm -hmm. it seems very feasible in so many so many ways yeah I, I i too am in favor and i wasn't in favor of it from the beginning in spite of my mascara running but um <laughs> but but i i think anything we do to show our public that we're transparent and that we're um accessible and that people could come to the meeting and contact us and we're never doing anything behind closed doors. It, that's the law. We're, we have to do that. But but to show proof that we are doing it is, is really important. So I'd be in favor of it too. And I also agree, you know, that many people don't have cable anymore. They have Hulu and all the different other programs. And so and everyone has YouTube. So so whatever whatever we could do, I guess you have to look into it to see how that works. 
So, sorry to go a second round. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, by the way, we cut cable many, many years ago. So mm -hmm. um, only Wi-Fi, and then we streamed through that. It's been doing that for four or five years. But um, Chris, so I guess it's for Chancellor, or if we were live streaming and say we even did, we did via Zoom, um, it would, would, um, would we then allow people to um, make public comments? No. So there's no, no under current code, we couldn't do that? Correct. They have to come in person and make public comment. Can I also but they can make comments about us if it's like on if it's an open YouTube channel and people well, can yes, make comments. Not, yeah, <laughs> we can't stop that. Yeah. You can disable comments. You could disable. You could comments, disable it, that, which sure. I heard is a good idea to do because so people don't get really negative, you know. So, but we, we want to. I don't want to. I, I, we have to let our IT people to tell us because I don't really uh, know what the proper thing and f make sure we're following all the regulations and all the. The Brown Act and uh, all the different regulations that we have to. You so would that need we, to disable comments because otherwise, then you have to hire someone to monitor it all the right. time. Yeah. So yeah. you just disable it. Right. Yeah, I think that's what I've told that it's a good idea. The trustee went right there. I'd also like to ask um, when this is implemented, can we um, advertise it, market it? Meaning, can we put it on our websites and let them know that this is now available to the community? I just don't want to do it, and then they not know about it. We've got to, got to put it out yes, there. Yes, we do that. We could put it on the website, and we could also put it as part of a link to the agenda. Just like the Zoom. Mm, one. That's a good idea. Okay. Okay. Well, and we could also possibly issue a press release saying, for the first time, I'd like that in the how many uh, many years <laughs> many many years of the district. That's the first time we did live streaming. I think it is. For, I don't well, know. We, we've, have we've we been ever done? We've been filming the board meeting for many many years, but we have never done live streaming. We've always filmed them, and they they used to show them on Friday nights and, and Saturday nights. I don't know if they still do that. The, the th board meetings. I think the press release is a great idea, and I think also on our uh, marquees outside of our entrance, we should let people know. I mean, when I get the red light, I, I read it all. So. <laughs> so, actually, that kind of brings up a, a it begs a, a question: we Do we continue design? the recording and <laughs> putting on thirty nine if it's live streamed and then light I want. <laughs> archived on our website? Do we need to continue recording for channel thirty nine? Well, I imagine if they're if they're recording it on YouTube, they're recording it as as well as as broadcasting but, it. Right. But that, that's a whole different process that they're going through right. now, and maybe it would be cheaper to do away with some of that. Something to think about. Well, my, sorry. I mean, I think that just so whoever's, well, they're not listening live, but when you listen afterwards, I mean, the whole idea behind this is not to supplant um, right. the uploading the videos to the website and other platforms. This is just additive to that. So whatever is recorded live stream, you can still go back and watch it over the weekend um, afterwards. I know your question's on whether we, do the public access channel or not? Um, I, mean, I mean, does that cost us? Like, would there be a cost mm -hmm. savings to discontinue that if you're already archiving it on our website and an opportunity to watch it live? Do you need to continue the process of recording it? And then, like, does it cost money to put it on the access channel? Those, those are things that should be considered in, in whatever recommendation is brought forth. Okay. So we'll look into that and get back to you. Yeah. Okay. So look into the looking into the cost and looking into the best way to do it. So, so it sounds like the board is um, unanimously. Um, oh, Matt, do you have something to say? Great. This is Matt Bodet. He's one of the um, um, key people in the film department. <laughs> Hi. Good evening. Um, so. Um, Trustee Prendergast, it would not be any cost savings. Um, we still have to go through the same process to uh, put it either on YouTube or on the channel. So, so the technology in the back room would all be used the same way. It wouldn't be a labor savings or a cost savings in any way. Same process, but is it necessary to then keep putting it on 39, I guess is the question. Um, I would say it is because a lot of our viewers 
don't have computers or know how to use them. So I would say we should uh, probably keep it going. Yeah, a lot of my constituents Point. in Laguna Woods. <laughs> yeah. But I don't think they get, do they get Channel 39 in Laguna Woods or no? They do. They do. They do? Okay, they excellent. Do. Great, excellent. One of the other things also is when we do a recording such as the board meeting, we want to make sure that it's preserved and we would want to run a backup recording, which would be the recording that we have now, actually. Um, and I had one other point. Um, oh, and it's usually posted, the recording is posted on our website usually, right? Yes. So I basically take that recording, do what I do with it, and then upload it to YouTube. Okay, great. And what would actually happen is the live YouTube um, video that would be produced from the actual night, if there was nothing that we needed to do with it, would actually, it would just stay the same. Okay. Mm -hmm. Matt, can you remind me? I forgot now. Sure. On Friday and Saturday, what time was it? Eleven o'clock on Saturday. Usually it was in the evening. Or, it's uh, seven a.m. and seven p.m. Oh, seven seven. Yeah. Okay. On uh, channel thirty nine and channel thirty three in Irvine. Oh, it is okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I've, I've turned on channel thirty nine and I've caught the meetings at different times, which I was delighted to to, to catch it. So. Sometimes, so sometimes I actually run it at different times, but those yeah. are the advertised times. I think it's good to let the public know what we're doing. These are our TV channels, you know. Our mm -hmm. TV channel is channel 39 in South County, which I get, and channel 33 up in Irvine, which some of the other trustees get. And it's good to have our uh, in, uh, public know what we're doing and, and able to tune in when, they, when they're interested in. So I just checked. I'm, I'm on, on board docs. I did check on the link. So the last, um, our last, Board of Trustees meeting had 24 views on YouTube. So let's let's mark that attendance and see that mm -hmm. um, see where it goes going forward. See if we can increase it. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Mm. Sounds good. We need data people. <laughs> may I mention we're one, data driven here, right? <laughs> may I mention one thing about the technology to actually do this? Um, we could have gone live tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a computer back there called the TriCaster, and I have it all set up and ready to go. So you guys were talking about possibly doing it next month. We would absolutely be able to do it next month as long as um, everybody in district agrees. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that, sound, that sounds great. I, I said really good things about the film department, and now I, I stand behind the, the things I just said. <laughs> no. okay. Thank you. Right. And, and thank you, you Trustee Whitwell-Dell, for bringing this up. That was a good idea. Thank you. Yeah. So we don't need anything else you need to say? Is that it? Oh, no. Okay, if you have you. any more questions, I'd be happy to answer them for you. Any other questions? He's... Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Right. Thank Thanks, you. Matt. Um, so they're going to try to bring it forward maybe next week. I'll talk about it, see how it goes. Month. Thank you. And then the next one is um, what so many employees have been talking about, the indoor mask mandate. And um, we actually have several options on this one. Um one of the options is um, we, the board would um, require the board monthly extensions of the indoor mask mandate at the regular meeting. That's option one. And option two, uh, it's recommended that the board um, extend the mask mandate and delegate the authority to the chancellor to lift the indoor mask mandate should the seven-day Orange County case rate fall below 10%. And to reinstate the indoor mask mandate should the seven-day rate rise about 10 percent, as reported by the Orange County Health Care Agency, or OCHCA. I would like to move option two, and I would like to okay, speak second. as to why. Second. Is there a second? <clears throat> okay. Second. Is there a second? I second it. Okay. So, Carol, so Trustee Prendergast made the motion, and Trustee um, Inman seconded it. I just have to say, I listened to a lot of, um, in, being a biologist, I listened to a lot of information about some of these things, and I was listening to TWIV this week in virology yesterday, and they said right now out of the New York Times, it says that there are over 400 deaths daily from COVID-19 now, and um, that means there are 3,000 in one week or 150,000 per year. So this has gone up from the way it's been in the past, and um, almost all of these people that are dying are not vaccinated, so um, it's really sad. And unless we get past getting 90% of the people vac vaccinated, we'll continue to see the virus mutate, primarily in the unvaccinated. Even though that, you know, the people vaccinated do get do get it too. You know, you just don't die usually. Trustee Prendergast 
Yeah, point Just of order, minute. maker of the motion has the first comment. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Robert's rules. Okay, go Thank ahead, you. go ahead. Um, but those are good points. Okay. Uh, I think for me, option two, uh, I think the, the key part of it is that it gives the authority to lift it if things get better without coming to us and without having to wait a month and so forth. So I think it goes both ways. I think it's the opportunity to institute it if needed and to lift if it's not. And I think that's a flexibility that that we absolutely have to trust our chancellor to make an informed decision um, on. So that's why I support option two. I think option one restricts too much uh, the ability to make decisions and having to come back every month to think about it and talk about it. It just makes it easier to delegate that authority, and it's not it's not a superpower. It's it's a you know, it's listed pretty clearly to go by data. I did have a comment about whether or not we need to have some sort of a policy on the type of mask. The data is very clear that cloth masks are fairly ineffective, that the N95s are uh, far more effective and, and reasonable. Uh, the designs are coming out much better. Um, and I know that early on, you know, as some of you know, my father's an epidemiologist, yeah. and he, he pointed very clearly to the data that the only reason we were using cloth masks is because N95s weren't available. <laughs> and they were restricting access to them so that they could be used for healthcare workers. That has been mitigated, and it's very readily available to get N95 masks or KN95 masks. So I don't know if that's something we would need to add to the policy or, or consider to the policy, but I would like to see it considered or discussed amongst uh, administrative staff. Okay. So we'll, so we'll just vote on this, and then they could discuss that. Could we could discuss it, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, trustee? Um, so, um, Come on. <laughs> yeah, I had, had a few comments. Um, first of all, I want to compliment a Margo Lovett. I think every, every district needs a Margo. <laughs> <laughs> a, a worthy a Margo. participant and engager. Um, and I and I mean that sincerely. <laughs> um, may, we agree most of the time, but I think your engagement is really valuable, um, and we have to be on our toes because she's on it. Um, <laughs> and Dan, do, do I do. so I appreciate the chancellor bringing it before the before us. I do think it's a policy issue, um, and I do think it's appropriate that it come to the board. Um, and I am supportive of. Um, given the data, given the heartfelt and sincere expressions of support from all of the um, participatory, go participatory governance groups that, that, that there, the mass mandate be in place for the time being. I do think there might be a hybrid option if the maker of the motion is um, interested in, in um, some kind of a mandatory language that I, I think um, that has in there, perhaps under option two, more easily than option one, some language that that should there be a lifting or a reinstatement of the mask mandate, that it's done in consultation with the board president. Um, I think that, to me, that's a that's a uh, a reasonable. You, you want to speak? No, I I, I need oh. his help on my. Um, on my <laughs> so uh, I think having consultation with the. You know, with um, with the board president, I, in I logged out by mistake. So. Oh, lift, and lifting or reinstatement of the of the mandate. So I got distracted. Um, so that that's um, I, I just was thinking of that as I read the two uh, options, and I I think I heard most of you wanted option two. Although Dan, you 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 were open to either option. I think in your communication to us, motion is option two. What's that? The motion is option two. So that means you're not willing to no, consider? No, no, I'm just saying that if, if, if you're asking if it's a friendly, it's only to option two. Thank you. Because option one isn't on the table right now. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I'm, you're asking, you were asking it to either one. I'm saying to limit it, it's option so two is the only thing on the table. Then are you the open to a mandatory language to option two? I, I am. Okay. okay. I, I think, I think uh, one of the roles of the board's president is to speak on behalf of the board on public items and things of that nature. And I think this would fall under the purview of any kind of a letter or communication from the chancellor. I don't know if it necessarily needs a board president's approval, but I think you, I, I, I think you're, I think, I think 
you know, with notification to the board president that it's coming so that they can, yeah. you know, be aware. I think that's, that's reasonable. So if we can get some sort of language like that added in as an amendment, I'm okay with it. Does the seconder agree? Yes. I think it's, <laughs> I think it's important that we don't wait a month till we meet to decide on this. It's, yeah. yes. it's paramount that when we see yeah, so the positivity go up, we need to act on it. And when the positivity falls, we need to act on it. So, um, but I like what Tim said. And let's blend it and do it. Wait, so do you want to do language now? Oh, I know. I'm looking at Cindy. <laughs> <'Cause>, um, <laughs> I think you would. I think you would just say it is recommended that the board extend the indoor mask mandate indefinitely and delegate authority to the chancellor in consultation with the board president. That's, okay. And then the rest. And then yeah. the rest. Yeah. Right. Simple. It sounds good. So you have to, you have to vote on the amendment first. No, because I considered it friendly. Oh, you considered it friendly. Okay. Okay. So we voted on it all at once. Call the question. Yep. Okay. Can I? Can we call the question? Is that okay with the motion and the seconders? Okay. Excellent. <clears throat> okay. Yes. Okay. Trustee Inman. Aye. Trustee Jay? Aye. Trustee Jamal? Aye. Trustee Milchaker? Aye. Trustee Prendergast? Aye. Trustee Whit Rydell? Aye. And Student Trustee Avalos? Aye. So just one other comment in regard to the masks and the quality of the masks. We've been changing that in the return to work guidelines as the as it shifted and recommended that people use masks that are, you know, medical high quality medical medical grade masks and not cloth masks. It's not a requirement, but it's certainly in there. It's highly recommended. Good. Okay, thank you. So that was unanimous. So excellent. Thanks, thanks everybody. I think it's important to keep people healthy, so really good. Um, the next one, item 7.6, trustees request for attending conference. And this is a conference, um, CCLC conference. Um, annual conference in California, November 17th to 19th. So is there a motion or second? So second. moved. Trustee Jay makes the motion. Is there a second? A second. Trustee, tr oh, Trustee Rydell seconded. I think I heard that second. Okay. And can we vote on this? And this doesn't mean that every trustee is going. This is the option to attend if you want to. You could move on. Okay, so we'll move on. Um, and I... We'll move on. So the next item is um, authorization of payment to a trustee absent from a board meeting. Um, and so is there a, a second and a, a... So moved. Okay, so Trustee Jay makes the motion and Trustee uh, Inman, you second it? I second it. Second it, okay. Um, should we vote by, by saying I and nay rather than do this? Okay, so we could try to vote on this one. See if it works. Okay, this is a trustee that was sick. They couldn't attend the meeting because she was sick. It's a Versus being in Greece. Yeah, if you, if, you go, if you go to Greece, you don't get paid for the meeting. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I hate that, but that's the way it is. <laughs> <laughs> but it was worth it probably, right? <laughs> Maybe. That, right? But it probably was worth it, right? I'm sure yeah. it was worth it. Costs, they say in economics. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Opportunity cost. You're right. You're right. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. So um, the motion. Yeah, the motion has passed on a on a six to um, zero vote, um, with the uh, student trustee abstaining. <laughs> and then um, the next one is our, our big agenda item, which is the uh, student housing presentation because uh, this is the fiscal considerations for, for doing student housing, and we, we actually vote on this item in, in, at, at the next meeting. So this is important to hear this stuff, I think. <laughs> so, oh, so do we have a motion and a second before we start? No, we don't need no, a motion. No, there's there's no, no we don't need a motion and a second because it's just a, it's just a hearing. Okay, great. It's not a hearing. 
presentation. It's a present. It's a presentation. It's a presentation, right? So I'd like to introduce um, the folks who are going to be doing the presentation tonight. As you know, this is the second of three uh, successive presentations that we're going to have for the board related to the student housing feasibility study. So tonight with us, we have uh, Mr. Ted Risher, who will be doing the bulk of the presentation. We also have Ms. Chelsea Bennett. They are both from the Scion Group, who are, um, is the firm that is doing the feasibility. And then myself and Mr. Medhani Ephraim are here for questions as well. So we'll turn it over to Ted. Great. I'll just do a quick intro again, Emory. But thank you again for having us over. Uh, again, last month we did present the uh, surveys that we did. Uh, and this month we're back. Uh, we're going to be talking about the financials. So Ted's going to be going through the, the slides uh, quickly, and we'll be taking some question and answers at the end. Thanks, Medhani. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this evening. Thank you for having me. Uh, I want to say that Chelsea and I have both been working with Madani and his staff and, and other folks at the district and the college level and just had uh, a, a really positive experience. The level of engagement has been um, just top notch and, and really, you know, uh, exceeded expectations in all levels of sort of support. And, and so we appreciate uh, their engagement. Uh, I'm going to go through this at a relatively high level, but please don't uh, hesitate to stop and ask questions. This is a, a high-level review of the results that came back from the demand analysis. Uh, the different levels are dependent on uh, rent levels. And if we were to finance privately through tax-exempt debt, through a P3 structure, that's pretty much the highest cost of financing. Uh, as opposed to, say, funding from SB 169 or other sources. And so you'll see as, as the rates come down, the demand grows. And so there's lots of demand for lower cost units, as you might uh, anticipate at both campuses. Uh, lower demand, but still fairly healthy demand even at the higher, uh, the higher rent levels. Next slide. Um, these are some examples of the tested rents uh, at both the P3, the high end, and the SB 169, the low end. The SB 169 is the grant fund, uh, the grant program that was promulgated last year uh, through DOF that recently was uh, enshrined in the executed state budget and awarded to 13 different colleges and community colleges across the state. Uh, and that's essentially dollar for dollar support on the hard and soft costs for construction and student housing. So these rents were developed with assumptions that we used initially prior to um, issuing the survey. Um, and they accounted for not only the cost of constructing and operating the student housing projects, but also the cost to finance the projects, so the debt service associated with private tax exempt debt. On the right are the SB 169 rents. They were developed to basically break even the project, to properly operate and recapitalize the project, but essentially not to create a profit center for the district or the college. Next slide. These are some of the units we tested. There's actually a wide range of units and configurations from uh, student housing by the bed for single students to apartment style housing for students with dependents, uh, spouses, or, or children. Next slide. So a high level uh, kind of summary of the approach. We actually tested each campus on five uh, approaches. One was a straight P3, which would be to, um, you know, essentially engage the private debt markets with a private development partner and a nonprofit owner. The other would be a P3 with a significant district contribution to uh, essentially balance the uh, get the rents back to uh, the tested rents. And I and I must say, when the initial testing rents were developed, we were in a different capital environment. Um, we have seen significant uh, turmoil in the in the debt market, so we've added additional costs and additional um, financing costs to this project, and that's why you're going to see a spread from the tested rents. Uh, the three uh, uh, scenario three was a sort of tweaked project that made the building more efficient and then added additional debt uh, to more heavily lever the project, but essentially reduce the pressure on the rents. Four was the straight up SB 169, making an application to the grantor agency, whether it's a DOF or the chancellor's office, getting funding for that and essentially operating the project on a break even basis. And then five was an efficient SB 169 project that focused on singles only, 
DOF has, in a, in a pattern developed through the last funding round, has shown that they don't view the cost per student for family units to be as desirable as the cost for student for single beds. Um, some of the programs test, just a brief overview of the program. We looked at the results from the uh, market and demand analysis, developed a program that addressed both singles and families for each of these. For our singles only uh, program, we came up with a program of approximately 400 beds. Um, and again, spread it across unit types that matched, uh, matched the demand we received back from the study. Just some model assumptions. We, we test pretty conservatively because we want to leave dry powder for uh, transactions should they come to fruition. We also assume that the district of the college was contributing a portion of the expenses. This is a pretty standard ask from uh, private investors. These are big funds, Nuveen, BlackRock, uh, New York Life, things like that. This is, these are just for the financed uh, uh, scenarios. And then we also added a significant amount of cost that the district or the college would uh, encounter by supporting these projects, by becoming more of a 24-hour environment than an 18-hour environment. Uh, and again, we worked closely with senior staff to make sure that we were making proper assumptions on this. Next slide. Uh, here's, again, a, a summary of each of the five programs tested across the both campuses. You can see high level there. You can see, you, you notice some of the red numbers here in the, on the far left under scenario one. We, had to, we actually had to raise tested rents by 69% to account for three things. One, the continued increase in construction costs, which haven't been brought down back to earth by uh, some of the Fed moves. Uh, also, the almost doubling of the cost to issue tax-exempt debt. Uh, we were closing transactions for California two years uh, last year. Uh, the last one we closed, we had a total interest cost of 3.16. Now we're modeling six. So that's how much the cost of debt has increased. Um, and then also the addition of the district costs were, those three factors were the primary reasons we had to raise rents so high. Um, you can see, uh, you can see the total cost of the programs there. The, the full freight on the escalated cost for the P3 was 150 million, uh, all the way down to the cost for the efficient SB 169 project targeting, targeting singles at 75. Uh, those are escalated costs, uh, accounting for presumed inflation. On the next slide, we really have the outputs and I'm not making any sort of qualitative uh, commentary about the outputs. This is simply the rents we would need to support these projects. Uh, as you can see, there is a 69% increase uh, for the straight P3 project over the tested rents related to those three cost factors I, I noted. Uh, in section two, where the district is putting up $57 million of its own cash, that's really just to buy down those rents back to the tested rents. Uh, in scenario three, where we added some additional debt and made the program more efficient, we, we do uh, see a significant decrease in the rents. However, we're still not back to tested rents. On the SB 169 case, you can see that those rents are fairly competitive for the mixed program. Uh, however, these types of rents uh, are not going to score well against DOS criteria, which establishes a rent ceiling. So we'd have to, we'd have to reconfigure that program a little. Uh, the same with the singles only program in five, uh, we'd actually get rid of those studios and and go with the other two. But that would be a reasonable submission for the next funding round for FY23 due at the end of October. Uh, the next slide for operational performance, it gives kind of a summary of the cash flows of each of these scenarios. Um, you know, again, the, the residual cash flow for number one, the 33 million, which is on the left towards the bottom, you know, that's great. That's residual cash flow that's coming back to the district as at risk ground rent. However, it's built on the backs of your students. Um, all three of the P3 scenarios cash flow um, and continue to cash flow. The SB169s, you'll see negative cash flow there, and that's primarily a result because we're escalating district costs at 5% and we're only escalating revenue at 2%. So eventually it's, uh, it's going negative and we're getting negative cash flow. So we would, have to, we would have to address that as well and ensure we started off with enough revenue to carry it through its life and not, and not be a burden on the district. Um, the district did some sensitivity analysis on, on the P3 rents. Again, we need a significant amount of rent to make 
the P3 projects work. So some considerations going forward. Um, you know, all the rental rates that we tested on the P3 side were significantly above market, and you can make uh, your own judgments as to whether or not they satisfy the goals and objectives of the district and whether or not it's worth the district's time and or credit to sponsor a project like that. Um, however, the SB 169 scenarios do show merit um, and probably deserve further consideration. And that's, uh, that's about it. And then next steps, you know, further refine and explore the SB 169 approach. Uh, come to agreement with senior staff about what a responsible rent structure would be that would not only properly operate and recapitalize the project, but reduce exposure in the future to, to the district and or the college. Uh, and really to be very responsive and work with you on, on devising a plan for a submission, if not in the FY23 funding round, then in the 24. Okay. Are there any questions from the board members or comments? Yeah. Trustee um, Jamal? And TJ had a question too. Uh, thank you for that. Well, that was sobering. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I mean, let's just cut to the chase. I, um, I didn't see very many good options uh, that were presented to us. But let's step back um, for a second. And I'm sorry, I missed last month's uh, live session. But um, do you feel that there's a demand for this kind of housing? For student housing? Yeah, for, yeah, for, for well, quality, that's what we're affordable about. student housing, of course, yes. Okay. But at rents that make sense for students. Right. And then... Um, under the various mo the, the models you presented, P all the P3 models and the SB 169 models, um, what is being done around the state? Um, for the last two years, we've been involved in pretty much all those transactions at Orange Coast College, Santa Rosa Junior College, and Napa Valley College. In fact, we are probably going to market in pricing for $115 million worth of private tax exempt debt for Napa this week. Um, we did also receive $31 million from the state from the last funding round for SB 169. That was a clan, that was a transaction that had to close because that's the way it had been struck. Um, the OCC is 99% full. Um, I think with many would consider it a success, although it does have its problems. No, no project's perfect. It also experienced the full brunt of COVID-19. So there was a lot of financial distress. Um, Santa Rosa Junior College is under construction, will deliver in the fall of 23. Um, by the, between the time we selected a development partner for a P3 there and the time we closed, the construction cost doubled. Right. So it was a massive value engineering exercise. We were still able to close it in an environment that was extraordinarily accommodating. That was the 3.16%. So we were able to give back a lot of value to the college and mitigate some of that cost expense. Napa was just a slog, and it is highly leveraged, but it's got basic real estate oomph to it. Um, there's a lot of attraction to that size deal in that part of California. It's got a lot of credit worthiness to it. Um, so we've really experienced the gamut. Um, we're hoping that the markets prove out our, our optimism for Napa, but again, that project started four or five years ago and has just been well let me ask one more question because you're not selling it to <laughs> tonight that's for sure um it, maybe it's not for you and maybe it's for the administration but um have you seen a correlation between en enrollments and the demand for housing on these campuses yeah I, I, it's a excellent question that we're often asked uh, when push comes to shove, the reality is, is there's not an ability to directly correlate one to the other. There are countless factors that go into a student's decision-making process, and housing is among one of those factors. Um, and so institutions don't generally te tend to collect all that data that articulates that so we can point, you know, make a, a direct correlation. However, we will say that we see often that institutions in certain situations do see at least a stabilization of enrollment, but we never want to make that assumption that is directly correlated because we don't have the explicit data to illustrate that. All right, thank you. 
I, I think so. When this first came to fruition and thought for me, I know was a big aspect of it was housing for our veterans and uh, homeless. Uh, so obviously having rents that are affordable is, is a big part of what we would like to try and accomplish. So uh, yeah, I think Trustee Jamal put it right. I think it's gonna be up to administrative staff working with you guys to figure out how can we do that and, and be affordable for not only for us, but our students, especially those groups. So I guess part of that is, is there additional funding from veterans organizations or, or homeless action, you know, things like that? Have that has that been looked into? Uh, we, we've been looking at a specific program that is pretty well established in the student housing business, which is this 501c3 program, which bases its residential eligibility on a set of IRS guidelines. So they have to be students of the college or they have to be faculty and staff. So it's very difficult to sort of intermingle those kinds of funds with, with other debt. Uh, I am experienced in affordable housing development in the state of California, and I will say that some of the sources and uses for projects start to get pretty eye-opening where you can literally have a dozen sources to try and cobble a goat cobble together enough money to make the project feasible. Uh, so if veteran housing or homeless housing is something that you want to specifically address, we can certainly speak with your staff about those. I wouldn't, unless you're talking about homeless or veterans who are students of the institution, I wouldn't consider them for this specific project type. Oh, yeah, certainly students only. <clears throat> yeah, 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 they have to be enrolled students to be eligible to. Yeah. And, yeah, and as you said prior, and I think which is on everybody else's mind, but the rents have to make sense and they have to work and they have to be a benefit for students. And that's what we're most focused on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now, Trustee, what yeah. Can I ask you, I'm so surprised that you just said this, that you, I mean, somebody thought that we would give housing to non-student? Oh, yeah. <laughs> what? Oh, yeah. I got nasty emails after our one meeting where we discussed it. Well, I'm surprised I didn't then. Um, do um, does Orange uh, um, OCC do, do they offer housing to non-students? Well, I will say that in the tenant waterfalls in that project, the first priority is on OCC students full time, OCC students part time, then faculty and staff, then visiting faculty. Oh. But if the occupancy were ever to fall to a point where it would start to jeopardize the coverage of the debt they could open up the building to students of other colleges or faculty from other colleges. They would have to meet an educational purpose. It's possible that non-OCC students or stakeholders could be living in there legally, yes. Hmm. But I don't believe that's the case now. Okay. Right, right. Can I ask you, what's the square footage of, this, of the, um, the smallest unit, the square footage? Uh, let's see. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Yeah, no, no. Um, two bedroom semi suites, probably 400 square feet net inside the walls. No, for a studio. No, for a semi suite. Uh, for the studio, I believe, is 327 square feet mm. inside the walls. They are efficient units. Yes. Efficient, that's a good word. No, I, I mean, I know of a university <laughs> in England where I had a friend go. And it was 275, and I saw it. It was, I was impressed, but I don't know if I could handle that. But it's everything they wanted. So these are all the little rooms you see at IKEA. <laughs> oh. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, it was very efficient, <laughs> and comfortable too. And it's something in California, specifically in California, where we start our assumptions on construction costs, just hard costs at $600 a foot for wood frame construction. It's something we have to consider. We have to get as efficient as possible to make sure we're maximizing the outcomes from the rent side for students. Well, I hope you're seeing a, a decrease in lease lumber with all the fires that we've had. I mean, the, the timber is just out there. And now that I traveled, I mean, I can't tell you how many trucks we had with, with logs. So I'm just hoping that construction is seeing a decrease as timber, opposed to the increase. Timber prices for the most part have started to plateau as, as production, as refinement capacity has caught up to demand. 
However, we're in this unique part. We're in this unique part of the economy right now, where demand is still high, mm. while borrowing costs are high as well. And so it's it's really creating a perfect storm of cost. Hell, mm. heck. I think Chip, are you finished? Or? My question. I don't know if you're allowed to answer it, but what um, what did the Orange Coast students pay? What is the rent there? Similar. I think it's a matter of public record. You can go on the website for the harbor, but okay. uh, you know they're they're fairly reasonable. Yeah. Also, it's, it's market. It's similar to what you you quoted us. That's why. No, no, it's no. Market. Much no. Market rate. less. More aligned with what's available in the market at what? current right. current point right now, and they're completely full at this point. I mean, of all so students, OCC full time students. See the point. Right. Just one more time, you said it was less. They pay less than what you quoted here. Oh, yes, yes. It, it was closed in a time when the construction costs were Much less. a third of what we're, of we're using in our model. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, with, with the price of debt, that's probably 50, or that's mm -hmm. probably 70% of what we're underwriting here. So, so like a school, of Orange Coast College, are, from the rents and and uh, of course the work that goes into working on and and you know making sure that these uh, facilities are ha habitable by students do they make money are they revenue neutral they're revenue po positive res revenue revenue negative i would say on a nominal basis they are revenue negative and that's primarily because their credit support features were called upon almost to the maximum by the effects of COVID-19. And so when, yeah, when they, they literally opened. Fall of 20. Yeah. Um, so I, I will say this, I would expect that in two years time, they will be revenue positive. Okay. Okay. So if I could follow up on some of the questions that were asked, uh, Trustee Jamal, I believe it was you who asked about the enrollments at mm -hmm. Orange Coast College and if they saw an increase in enrollments when they opened their OCC. Looking at the coast... Or, if, or the other way, or if um, higher enrollments mean a higher demand for the housing. Right. So just looking at the coast district in its entirety they have seen a 19% decrease in their FTES since the fiscal year 2018, 2019. Yes, so we're not seeing that it is even keeping them neutral. I mean, as a district, we're down 11%. And so they're down 19%, even more so, even with housing. And then I think the other question on what are their rates? Their rates are at market rates, which is what Ted said. And if you remember the rates that we tested and the rates that we did our financial analysis on that you saw tonight were well above market rates. So as we mentioned, the P3 rates are about 69% above the tested rates, and the tested rates are anywhere from 50 to 60% above market. And on the SB 169, the rates are even higher. They're about 80% above market. So we're doing a feasibility study on the tested rates that we did, and those tested rates are well above what the market rates are. So in order for us to get affordable housing, um, at this point, I don't know that we would be able to do a P3 option in order to make it affordable for the students. The only thing that we might be able to do would be the SB 169 option, and when you do that, then all of the beds have to be for low-income students and then at our next um, meeting in August, we can go through what all the requirements would be in order to qualify for a 160, SB 169 grant for the construction, because they are lengthy. Uh, one of the requirements is that the students have to be enrolled 12 units for both semesters and that they be housed for 12 months, so not just for fall and spring, they have to be there for 12 months. So that's a big shift in kind of how we work with our students. Not all students go in the summer and may not be here in the summer, but we would have to um, provide the housing to them for 12 months. So, but we can bring all of that next month with what the SB 169 uh, requirements are. We have time 
because new applications, um, Chancellor's Office won't be accepting them until October 31st, 2023. Oh. So, unless they change. That's the way the code reads right now, but they may, uh, they may try to bump that up to October 31st, 2022. Um, but the way it's in code right now, it's 2023. Okay, Trustee mm -hmm. Sorry, Jamal. Sorry, I'm Jamal. not trying to lengthen this out. Um, yeah, I'm looking at the harbor rates and, and their... Um, I wouldn't say the student rate housing. Yeah, and, and I will say this, yeah. that every college or district is unique, and I don't think that affordability was necessarily the over uh, overarching goal of OCC's <laughs> project. It was to... Stabilize enrollment. Well, the studio apartment is going for twenty one hundred right now. Yeah, and, and, and like I said, I, I think OCC mm -hmm. had different objectives. Yeah. So, um, just one other question, and maybe it's a next month question. Um, even though this was a sobering report, um, which doesn't seem to have too many pass forward, but would there be any consideration of looking at, you know, housing, for example, uh, for IVC students because they have a greater foreign student population? So both of the analyses um, or the feasibility that we've provided you would work for either campus, either Saddleback or IVC. So this is just the project, how much one project at this district would cost. Um, you know, so if we wanted to do one at each campus, these rates apply and everything applies. I will say this, all of these rates are engineered to return every single dollar to the district and to eliminate, at least on paper, all financial risk to the district. So the district has to, and the colleges have to consider what they're willing, if anything, to use to subsidize these projects. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. That was somewhat sobering, but interesting. Uh, now we're having the consent calendar, item number nine. Are there any items that board members would like to re re remove from the consent calendar? Trustee Inman? Uh, 9.14. Okay, 9.14. And I, I'm, here it is. And I, I, anybody else? I'll just, um, Remove that 9.12 just to, to make a comment about it, okay? A quick comment. <laughs> so, is that it? I Trustee? Have, I just have some questions on hmm. 9.7. And, yeah, I think that's the only. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so now we need to vote. I move the balance of the items. Okay, thanks. Is there a second? Second. So Trustee Jamal moves the balance of the items, and Trustee Jay seconds. Please vote on this item now. So the item passed unanimously with a six to zero, um, and and a uh, trustee advisory vote of yes. And I I, I was just going to mention number nine twelve because I did mention this in a speech I made a few days ago, um, that we have the earn to learn to earn problem for students at our colleges. Uh, money that we receive from the HERE funds, we're actually um, able to do donate um, laptops, Chromebooks, and iPads to students who um, complete these programs. And th these are students that are disadvantaged students and students with equity, uh, according to SEA guidelines. So that, I'm proud of this, and it's a good thing to talk about. So I, is there a motion and a second for this? So move. So move, Trustee. Um, second. Okay, a motion and a second, and now we vote on it. Thank you. Okay, Trustee Pendergast made the motion. <laughs> and Trustee um, Jay, did you second it? Yeah. Trustee Jay seconded, okay. Okay, the, the motion passed six to zero with the student uh, tr with the student trustee advisory vote of yes, and now we're moving to oh item nine point seven, which is um, 
Trustee um, Whit Rydell um, pulled it. Do you have a question on that item? Yeah, I do on page one of three when it talks about the contractor's names, uh, number nine and number 13. Um, I was just wondering when it talks about the math science youth camps for the community education program, I think that's wonderful. And um, a reasonable amount of money was, um, you know, the contract total amount. But I wondered, was that camp full? Does anybody know? We're giving money. Was the camp full? You don't know? Because I'm just curious. I mean, we set aside the money, so if five students come or if 20 students come, yeah, that's we, what. We generally cancel classes if they're that under-enrolled, so we would not be taking a hit on a community education class. Okay. All righty. And then number 13, renewal of Blackboard. Um, I didn't, I thought, I didn't know we still had Blackboard. I didn't think so either. Software to assist with digital course content. That was 24,000, so. What is it? Oh, uh, Ally is a, it may be made by Blackboard, but the, the software is Ally. Uh, oh, I didn't know. Okay. Ally helps us identify, correct me if I'm wrong, Vice President Zo Kumamoto, helps us identify ADA issues, disability issues. It ensures access in the learning management system. Is Thank you. It's good to know. Thank you. And can I just go back on the community education? By law, we cannot use general fund money to pay for it. It has to cover its own costs. Okay, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so do you make you want to make the motion? Sure. See what we do? I move that we pass nine point seven. seven. Yeah. Yes. And is there a second? Second. It is seconded by Trustee Jay. And now now we can vote on item number nine point seven, contracts. Did the motion pass six to zero with the student trustee advisory vote saying yes. Now the next one is nine fourteen and trustee Inman pulled it. Yes, my question, well, first of all, what mm. um, a huge endeavor these people are trying to do. Yeah. I keep reading about all these organizations that we're going to coordinate with each other, and it's hard to picture that it will work, but I certainly hope it does, of course. Uh, what I'm interested in is um, th whether the marketing to get, the, I, I'm not sure I understand who the students are. Is any of the marketing internal within our campuses and our immediate communities, or is it all external? The, what caught my eye, because I've been involved um, in prison um, education, what caught my eye was the part on page 68 where it had um, the sheriff and the men's and women's jail, et cetera, James Music and, and Theo Lacey. So it, is this group going to go and go to these facilities and help people, or does anybody know what, what the point is? And I guess it's really marketing, and then how does it, how does it work? So this is a very uh, complex, multilateral consortium, and our role in it, Trustee Inman, is primarily as the training center. So mm -hmm. we are referred folks who go to a one-stop center and who are looking for new training and employment opportunities and may be referred to us because they're in our service area and or because we have a program of interest uh, that is appealing to them. Uh, the marketing, I would expect, though again, this is not our role, mm -hmm. uh, would be external as you have defined it, though in that our students are also members of the community, they may also right. receive some yeah. of that marketing. But again, that, that wouldn't necessarily be helpful because they're already in those training programs that we hope will be remunerative for them in the long run. Did I answer your question? I think so, okay. yeah. Thank you. Okay, so Trustee Edmund, do you want to make a motion to? Okay, I move that we um, pass 9.14. Okay, is there a second? I second it. Okay, Trustee Edmund makes the motion, Trustee Jay seconds it, and now we can vote on this item. <laughs> <clears throat> Passed unanimously, six to zero, with the uh, student trustee advisory vote is yes. And the next item is 
five-year construction plan, um, and there's uh, initial project proposals and final project proposals, IPP and FPP. So was there a motion and a second? So moved. Trustee Jay makes the motion and... Second. Trustee Hinman seconds <laughs> it. Are there any questions? These are um, six, six different projects. So um, can, can we vote on it now? Okay, the item passes six to zero with the trustee student advisory vote of yes. And uh, we're moving to um, the Performing Arts Center, item 10.2, at Irvine Valley College. Um, and they would like to have more storage space. So would I. <laughs> no, it's great, though. It's a nice facility. So do we have a motion and a second? I so move. Okay, trustee. I second. Motion and trustee Jay seconds it. Um, the question. Tru trustee Jamal. So, um, <clears throat> Was this uh, something that could have been anticipated beforehand, the need for storage for John or someone from IVC? Or, or Anne-Marie? <laughs> I think it was something that was identified during um, building the pack, but it was identified late, and so rather than amending the scope of the pack building at the time, they were kind of... They left it and let the pack go as was. And so this has been something that they were trying to not need or desire. But with the um, increase in the things that are happening at the pack, then they've identified that they have the need for this additional storage right outside of it. Okay, so are there any other questions or comments? Good idea. I move the item. Okay, Trustee Prendergast moves the item. Is there a second? Second. Second, okay. Um, what? Oh, it was, okay. What? Okay. Yeah, okay, so now we can vote on it. Thank you. And I think, I think you know, Performing arts areas always need additional storage <laughs> for all the props and everything else. Okay, it was passed unanimously, six to zero, with the student trustee advisory vote is, is uh, voting for it. And the next one is award of engineering services for electrical uh, infrastructure projects of IVC. Um, this has to do with their photovoltaics on top of the um, on top of the uh, the, the parking uh, places in the parking lots. Okay, is there a motion and a second? So moved. Trustee Jay makes a motion and Trustee Inman seconds it. Second. <laughs> okay. Um, so these these are really good idea to environmentalists environmentally and plus they do give some shade for the parking for the cars. So can we vote on it, please? It's not just the parking. Yeah. It's beyond that. No, no, I know that. And and, and for the uh, saving of energy for this, for the saving of climate change for everything. Thanks. Okay, so um, it, it was passed six to zero um, with um, the student at trustee advisory vote of yes. Okay, thanks. And then... Um, the next one is academic employee and classified administrator personnel items. So I think um, the first one is item 10.1, 11. 11.1, 11.1. And I think, um, I think we should have a motion and a second and then, and then Cindy will read out something. So, so uh, okay, trustee Jamal makes the motion and trustee, <laughs> trustee, um, 
Whit Rydell seconds it, and um, um, Vice, Vice Chancellor Viscachill is going to read out something right now. Thank you. There is a contract associated with this agenda item. So in um, compliance with the law, the position for this uh, contract is Acting Director of Learning Assistance. The employee name is Jennifer McConkey. The contract dates are July 11th, 2022 through June 30th, 2023. Range 17, step one, annual salary 130,944. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So now we can vote on it. And um, it was unanimous, six to zero, with the student trustee voting uh, in favor of this item. Uh, the next item is 11.2, classified personnel I items. And I um, have to mention the, that there was uh, somebody retiring, Kathy, Kathy Greeno works in the district office, a payroll specialist who is retiring after 21 years and 11 months. So we thank her for her many years of service to our district. Um, is there a motion and a second? So moved. So moved by Trustee Jay, is there a second? Second. Second by Trustee Inman. Okay, we can vote on it, please. <laughs> there it is, okay. This was unanimous, six to zero, with the student trustee voting for the item as well. Um, and the next we ha items we have are the um, informational items. So I'll just read the informational items. There's um, initial proposed between the district and the POA. Um, there's um, the initial pr proposal between the district and the CSEA, Chapter 586, Article 8. Um, there's staff response to public comments from the previous meetings, Saddleback College CTE report, Retiree OPEB Trust Fund Report, Facilities Plan Status Report, and written reports. There are three excellent written reports from the Chancellor and the two college presidents I, I recommend to you with things that are going on. And then I'll ask um, if there's any oral reports. So, Trustee uh, Chancellor Kathleen Burke, are there any other comments? I'd like to go last. You'd like to what? I'd like to go last. Like to go last. Okay, great, great. <laughs> I want the final word. With the final word, I, I saw, I saw, I, and, and I saw your name on the, um, uh, you know, on, on the personnel item, but I didn't bring it up again because we already brought, talked about it. So I didn't, didn't, didn't want to be, be the dead, you know, say over and over again. Okay, Urban Valley College, Dr. John Hernandez. Thank you, Board President Milchaker. I am. Um, Thrilled to introduce you our new Vice President of Instruction, Rick Miranda, who's with us here today. Great. Rick, welcome. Welcome. Um, Rick comes to us from Cerritos College, where for the past six years he was Vice President of Academic Affairs and Assistant Superintendent. And prior to serving in that role, he was Dean of Academic Affairs for four years at Cerritos. Uh, prior to that, he served as a professor of biology for Taft College. He's a seasoned uh, administrator and looking forward to working with Rick in the years to come. And I also just want to extend my appreciation to Dr. Irene Malgram, who we were able to lure out of retirement mm -hmm. to serve a short stint during the uh, spring and summer, and just want to appreciate uh, and thank her for her leadership. Okay, thank you. And he's got to be good if he's a biologist, you know, a fellow biologist. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. And the next Saddleback College president, Dr. Elliot Stern. While she gets the last word, um, <laughs> I at least can get a word in. Uh, and I have a feeling I speak for many colleagues at this table. Um, I want to thank Dr. Burke for her service. I want to thank her personally for taking a chance on a VPI from a college of 5,000 to do this job. <laughs> I want to thank her for her stewardship, for her chill, deliberative manner. I want to thank her for using a student lens and for constantly and unheedingly using science and data at a time when the world seemed to be going crazy in its lack of understanding of data and science. So thank you for being here during this period. Thank you for your guidance. Thank you for your support and for making our employees and students safe and for making this a great experience for all of us. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, very well said, very thank you. And then the Vice Chancellor for Business Services, Dr. Anne-Marie Gable. Thank you, I do have a couple things tonight. So first and, and um, first off, it's my pleasure to announce that on July 8th, I signed an access and option agreement with the Southern California University of Health Sciences. 
and we did receive their deposit on July 11th. So we are in the midst of the planning period with a new uh, potential entity at ATEP. They will be located just um, west of the IDEA building, and they're taking a 6.8 acre parcel, and they'll build about a 155,000 square foot facility. So very excited to uh, announce that at the board tonight. And then lastly, um, I would be remiss if I didn't also thank Kathleen for her stewardship over these last four and a half years that she's been with us, a little over four years. Um, she is always uh, instilling in us that we need to do the right thing. And even when it's not a fun decision or something that we know is not going to be popular that um, we follow the law, she has the utmost ethics, and it's much appreciated. And she did challenge us, and everyone at this table, to uh, make us better, so thank you. Thank you, thank you, and, and, and um, both, I agree with you on both those, but the, that wonderful school that we're getting at ATEP fulfills so many different things, it fulfills the requirement we have for a school, which we need to have, and, and doesn't con conflict it so fulfills the, what we need to have as a school, and it doesn't conflict with any of the other K-12s or universities, and it's just like an asset to everything. So thank you for doing a great job with that. Thank you. Okay, the next one is um, uh, Vice Chancellor of Educational Services, Dr. Chris McDonald. Good afternoon. I've got two items. Uh, the first, tomorrow we're having a big day in our ERP discussion. We're having um, all-day session for the banner, the student information system component of it. So faculty, staff, and students, managers are all invited. We'll have additional sessions um, in the fall when the faculty and students return. We're also having sessions on August 25th for human resources and finance. So um, the deep dive and the work actually begins uh, tomorrow. Um, my second item, I want to thank uh, Dr. Burke. Um, there are just so many memories and so many lessons learned, and I really appreciate your operational orientation, very good operational manager. And one of the key things you taught me about leadership, and I'll just do one, but there are many. Uh, Kathleen one day said to me, you know, Chris, it doesn't matter what you say, it only matters what they hear. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and I pause. I'm like, wait, it doesn't matter what I say. It only matters what they hear. Mm -hmm. And I'll never uh, forget that because how we communicate as leaders matters. How we make tough decisions matter. But getting the word out, trying to be in touch actually matters. So I just want to thank you, Kathleen. You've done a lot for me. You've done a lot for this district. You've done a lot for our community, and we really appreciate you. Yeah, thank you. Beautiful, beautifully said. Thank you. And the Vice Chancellor of Human Resources, Dr. Cindy Viscochill. I have one item, Dr. Burke. I'm a better administrator for having served under your leadership. And you have assembled one of the finest executive teams I've ever worked with. We respect one another. We listen to one another. And the district is better for that leadership team that you have put together. But mostly we're better because of all that you've brought to the position of Chancellor. Thank you. Beautifully said as well. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Burke. We, and we, now my turn. Your turn. <laughs> yeah, I was, so I'd, wanna... like, I'd like to start by thanking the board for your uh, faith in me, for hiring me four years ago and taking a chance on a college president, uh, stepping up into a leadership role with a board of trustees. Uh, I have felt your support, and I appreciate it deeply. And now to the faculty the staff, and the administration, all these people assembled before you. You all know my first priority is students. It's always students, and that's the first thing you hear from me. I even change written communications to make sure that students come first because words are things, and the order that we put them in matters. And so uh, as a team, First of all, I deeply appreciate everything you've, all the kind words you've said. Um, this is, to the board, the finest team I've ever worked with, all of them. Everyone in this room who supports students 
and does what needs to be done every day. And I know the board knows that, but it's still important to say that and to acknowledge their time and their dedication, particularly over these years of the pandemic that have uh, challenged all of us to be better and all of us to think about how we can improve our work with students and for students. Things will never be the same, and I know you all know that. And that means we have to work even harder to make sure that we have the impact on students and that we help them point them in the right direction the same way we were pointed in when we were in school. So I, I leave you, I thank you deeply for that work because it's important to me. Uh, as a community college graduate myself, I know the importance of the work that we all do. And I leave you with two thoughts. One I heard just last week, a father told his daughter, uh, she was a differently abled young woman, never let someone turn your sky into a ceiling. Mm -hmm. So I leave you with that. And I leave you with one other thing for those of you who ever watched the West Wing, <laughs> and I love the West Wing, uh, whenever there was a transition, if you remember it, President Bartlett, Jeb Bartlett always said the same thing. And I leave you with this for all of us. What's next? Uh, so, thank you. and now I turn it back to you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay, okay. That, that was really beautiful. <laughs> really, I wrote I wrote it all down. So thank you. Beautiful. So the meeting is adjourned. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs>